the Boat Biz Podcast with the MRAA. We have some incredible content lined up for you with this podcast uh, that we're going to be delivering industry updates, insights that boat dealers need to be aware of, opportunities that dealers can take advantage of, and our favorite part here at the MRAA, actionable ideas that you can implement. First and foremost priority for us in everything that we do here at the MRAA is to deliver on our mission. And that mission is really to recognize that uh, if our industry is going to be successful, our dealers have to be successful. So we drive the success of our dealers. Uh, It's something we're very passionate about here. And the way that we look at things around here, it's always a great time to be in the boat biz. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Episode 8 of the Boat Biz Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I am super, super excited to share uh, the insights and the wisdom of, of our guest today, a great friend of ours, Amy Mozzie from Centurion Supreme Boats. Amy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Matt. I'm super stoked to be here. Yeah, we, we've we had a little bit of this conversation uh, that we're going to dive into on the post-deposit nurturing over the last couple of years and kind of wa- I've kind of watched as you've built this and and been rolling this out. So uh, I'm super excited to dive into that and and chat with you about that and kind of hear uh, the evolution that you've had. Uh, I think our listeners are going to be blown away by by what you're doing. So super excited about that. Uh, before we uh, we dive into that, I know you're the uh, Vice President of Marketing and, and Brand Direction at Century and Supreme. Uh, give us a little bit of the history of kind of where your career has taken you and, and how you got to where you're at today. And then maybe we'll chat a little bit about what the VP of uh, Marketing and Brand Direction does. Well, yeah. How long is the podcast? No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I didn't start here. That's for sure. I started in 1998 and I worked for a competitor and um, worked there for 15 years here locally in Merced, California, where I was born and raised, believe it or not. But I started in the industry as a computer nerd. I, uh, I, I applied for a job that was in the IT department and ended up getting it. Um, but I've always had an affinity. In fact, I went to school for communications. I didn't actually graduate, but I did go to school for communications. I've always had an affinity for communications, marketing, been a little bit more on the creative side. But at the time in the early 90s, when I graduated from high school, I kind of got bit by the internet bug. You know, that was the beginning of the World Wide Web and I couldn't really think about much else. So I started designing web pages and ended up running an ISP in town or even running all of their dial up motives, motives, modems, 14, 400 baud motives and Unix servers, you know, I mean, so I was I was a nerd. Uh, There's no other way to put it. So I ended up um, applying for an IT position, got and um, worked. It was actually at Malibu Boats here in town. And they were um, a very large presence here, but I knew nothing about the boating industry. And once I got into it, I started to realize that there was a very big need there for someone that could um, manipulate graphics and design as well as uh, copyright. And um, my boss at the time um, let me help on the marketing side. And, and I was helping Mr. Paul Singer, who at the time was the, um, I believe he was the vice president of sales and marketing then. Uh, and, uh, and he pretty much, I don't even think it was a year. And he's like, okay, you're in marketing now. So, so I, I became a marketing assistant and um, I worked uh, there for about 15 years and then moved on, worked for another um, competitive boat manufacturer for three years after that in a marketing manager type role. And, uh, and then I came to Centurion and Supreme in um, 2014, December of 2014. And I, a lot of the guys and girls that I worked with previously were here and they're also in Merced, California, or at least that was the base of the factory then. And, and we ended up, um, uh, starting together I, with Shane Stillman, who was also with me in a previous life, and um, Scott Berenke, um, and we ended up bringing on Paul in 2016 after Correct Craft purchased um, Centurion and Supreme Boats. So it was kind of like old home week after a while, <laughs> and uh, and we've kind of as a team, all of us together have have really worked together along with all of the other employees here to grow Centurion and Supreme to where it is now. Yeah. And, um, that's that's awesome. why I'm, we're extremely blessed. And that's really, it's because of that team and those people that I've, I've, you know, 
made it to this position in my career for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the The boat business has a way of grabbing us and keeping us, right? I mean, you, once does. you get your your foot in the door, and then of course, yeah. most of that is based on those relationships, right? Mm-hmm. And and the the people in yep. this industry and the way they kind of uh, create those relationships and and keep you in it. That's just that's a great story. No, oh, yeah, it's funny. It's roundabout, but yeah. uh, but definitely, I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned uh, Paul Singer. Paul just uh, retired uh, this this Good. late last year. We were there for the uh, last dealer meeting. But um, you know, we were talking briefly about this previously. But the you know there was the acquisition with Correct Craft. But I was at your dealer meeting. Uh, I want to say it was 2019 or something like that in Austin, Texas. I think that's and right. You, they, you laid out the vision of, hey, here's what we're going to do to to grow our dealers and to grow our brands. And we're seeing that happen. But what's been what's been kind of the secret ingredient behind how you've done that? Honestly, it all starts with a correct craft. I mean, with a being a correct craft company, which they bought the controlling interest in um, uh, the summer or the spring, I guess, late spring of 2015. Yeah. And as a correct craft company, we, I mean, you can kind of see it behind me here. Yeah. Um, we, we run everything through the lens of this pyramid and ultimately our culture. And we, we look at everything. We try to, um, any hard decisions we have, we try to go back to that. You know, what is our, why, why are we here doing this? It's to make life better. And that's what it comes down to. I mean, we build boats to the glory of God, but ultimately at the center of what we do, it's making life better. And it's amazing how easy that makes decisions. Um, we're not making a decision to please a board of directors or a, or a stockholders. We're making decisions so that it's better for the next guy or gal that's standing next to us on the production line or in an office meeting. It's uh, it makes everything very, very clear. And I would say that once we all fully grasp that as a leadership team, um, that's why we've had the success we've had. And ultimately, we had an amazing leader in Paul Singer uh, who gave us the autonomy to make decisions in our departments based on that why. Um, and and he gave us the counsel we needed. But at the same time, he also gave us the freedom we needed to do things as we would do them, but using that as a lens. Um, and uh, ultimately, I think that's why we are where we are. And now we have a leadership team that Paul had started and put together. And now um, Daniel in Delegato, who's our interim president, is leading. And we're, you know, one of us picks up where the other one leaves off. And we all have this common goal and it's making life better. And we all are in it together. And I mean, our success up to this point, I, I know sure as I'm standing here is because of that, but going forward, we're going to sustain this success for that same reason. Right. Right. Yeah. I love it. I mean, a lot of people talk about culture and the importance of culture and that sort of thing. I know with, with correct craft and the Centurion Supreme brands and so forth, it's not just a, uh, pyramid that you put on the wall. It's not just something you talk about, but that culture, uh, permeates the team, the employees, but also extends out to your dealers. I mean, you can see that and feel that at the dealer meetings. For sure. And when we talk about making life better, I mean, obviously, selfishly speaking, we're all human beings. We would love to make our own lives better. We want to make our employees' lives better, but we want to make our dealers' lives better. We want to help them be more successful. And our vendors, our vendor partners as well, um, organizations like MRAA that we work with, we want we want to make your guys' lives better and your membership's lives better. Right. Um, it it seems like a a very simple goal, um, but it is it's very genuine, it's authentic, and we're given that drive, that autonomy to do that from a correct craft level. So to me, there's nothing but power in that. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. So, uh, tell us a little bit about, so today, vice president of marketing and, dir- and brand direction, what does that <laughs> encompass? What's, what's your day-to-day look like and what's your responsibilities? Um, yeah, it's, that's a title, you know, and I'll say, we say it all the time here. It doesn't really matter. I could be giving a plant tour, uh, to a customer, um, having a conversation on the phone with a customer that a retail customer, and um, just as well as I could be giving a presentation at a dealer meeting. I mean, my 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 tasks are are day to day, but I tend to be um, 
they they joke with me and they tell me you're the face of the company that's what you are you're the face of the company which means i have a lot of conversations but they give that role to me i think because i like to talk <laughs> so so but um i mean from day to day i I do everything. I say I it really all I do is kind of ask questions anymore. We have a, a great marketing team. We have a great sales team, but um, I'm I have to report to Correct Craft based on budgets and things as far as boats that we ship and get paid for that type of thing. We have to strategically plan. We're a strategic plan driven company right now. We're in our next four year strategic plan, which ends I think in uh, 2025 at the end of 2025. So we have a number of initiatives. We have a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal that we're always looking at and making sure that we're on the way or on the path towards achieving that or exceeding that. And um, I, we have a lot of initiatives that are going to lead us to achieving that goal. And we check back or I check back with that weekly with our teams and make sure that we're still on track and on a path. And every once in a while, I get to sit around and do fun stuff like work with um, Shane Stillman, who's our VP of product development on designs for the coming year. Um, as a brand manager, that's a big part of my job is taking feedback, especially right now during boat shows, when uh, we have customer direct retail customer feedback on our product, we have a unique opportunity to take in what they're telling us they like, or they don't like about the boats and then make adjustments for the next model year. Yeah. And um, that's a that's a big part of what I do is to kind of gather that information from our sales team, from our dealer network, and then try to communicate that to PD&E and work with them to end up with a design that is just that much better for that following year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anybody that knows you uh, knows your commitment, knows how invested you are in, in <laughs> the brands and the industry and the, the experience and everything. And I know our, our listeners can, can hear it and feel it as well. So, um, very cool. And, and, um, I know that, you know, you didn't mention this as part of your role, but I know you've been out on the, uh, the tour, uh, hitting boat <laughs> yeah. shows. Yeah. Uh, how's boat show season been going for you? You know, boat show, we started out with a lot of, um, um, concern, I think, as most of our dealers and most of the industry did, you know, we're coming out of two years that are unlike anything any of us have ever experienced. Um, and then all you hear uh, leading up to boat shows is, you know, economic downturn and, right. and challenges out there in the marketplace in general, not just um, not just our industry. So I think we went in with, a, I'm going to say, a healthy skepticism about how the season was going to go. Uh, we we try not to operate out of fear. There are certain things we can't control, and we try to be not you know toxically positive, but at the same time understanding that if we do face challenges, we can get through them, and we know we can. We've done it before. Um, but honestly, pleasantly surprised, and I say that same phrase to most anybody that asks me about boat shows. Um, it's really what we hoped would happen. And I know hope is not a strategy. We say that all the time, but we really hoped that we would be pleasantly surprised. And we have been. The conversations we've been having with customers at shows, uh, our dealers' uh, ultimate success as far as you know what it comes down to is how many deposits did you get at the show is um, a level at which we had, I would say, I would compare it to 2019, yeah. which is wonderful. Um, I think there was this lingering fear that everything was going to fall off a cliff. Um, we all kind of knew if we thought about it logically that that couldn't happen. It's not going to happen. But we were looking at it in terms of where we've been over the last two years, which ultimately is not accurate. You know, I mean, that's it's it was wonderful. We were super blessed. But at the same time, um, it couldn't last forever. Right. You know, there was nothing that could really be sustained about that level of work. And honestly, with as depleted as a lot of our dealers became and we became, um, we wouldn't have wanted that to last forever. I mean, I know that the sales are wonderful, but when you can't truly service a customer well and create a unique experience, it's not worth it in the end because that customer most likely is only going to be, you know, a one and done customer. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's good. I mean, we've, we've, been pleasantly surprised and uh it's just getting better from here as the show started i think they they surprised us at first in a good way and then it's just gotten better and the follow-up from the shows is very very strong yeah. 
which is great. Yeah. Um, that's something that I think I don't know that we've really seen as strong a follow up. And you, know, you could equate that to dealers maybe being a little more motivated to follow up, but you could also equate it to people knowing that they need to make a decision. It, it's no longer it's no longer just something we we pay lip service to that, hey, we really need you to um, give us this deposit before the show ends or make a decision or confirm your boat. Now they understand having gone through the the COVID times that we we need that confirmed order in to schedule and get it built in a good amount of time and get it to the customer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so great uh, opportunity here for us to kind of segue into what we were going to chat about. You talked a little bit about the anomaly that was the COVID business environment. Right. Uh, we've, we've transitioned into this post pandemic marketplace now, but mm-hmm. the, the focus on the customer experience and the need to, to use, to deliver what you noted as a unique experience for them uh, in, in buying boats and so forth. Um, you've kind of brought those two together over the last few years in creating what you are calling a post-deposit nurturing program right. for for your boat buyers. So to start us off, tell us what is a post-deposit nurturing program? Well, I came up with that term just because there there wasn't much out there that really described what we were looking to do. In fact, the first several uh, individuals that I floated this idea to, it was a little foreign uh, because everybody's used to lead nurturing. So we'd nurture and create an experience prior to the sale. That's traditionally how it's done. And in years past, especially the last two years when we've all been so taxed and there's been so many sales, it's like, okay, you made this decision. You're ready. You gave us your deposit. Thank you. We'll see you in eight to 12 weeks when your boat gets here, if you're lucky, (laughs) you know, Um, and that's the way it was. So we actually fell into that trap as a company where we were so busy. We were trying to keep up. We, our production levels or capacity levels were not what they needed to be. We weren't prepared for the demand that was out there. And then the dealer wasn't prepared for the added um, influx of demand that they received. So we just went from the next customer to the next customer, the next customer. And in the process, we ended up not being good communicators. We ended up not really making the experience, the level of the boats we build. Um, We build amazing product and the customer that is investing in this product really for the sake of their family's own joy on the water deserves more communication. They deserve to understand exactly where their boat is in the order process. And honestly, we need to make it fun for them along the way. We need to make it notable, remarkable, so that they're not only happy in their family or when they're with their circle of friends that's ex- expecting this boat, but so, so remarkable that they're talking about it to their friends, to their neighbors. You can't believe what I got today. Um, you know, my boat's coming here and in X amount of weeks, um, I got this really cool email that shows me, you know, what parts are going in it or, or whatever it may be something that's remarkable. They, they deserve that. Yeah. Um, and, and we, we need to be good stewards of their enthusiasm. Right. You know, we need to make sure that we continually engage them throughout the process. Otherwise what ended up happening, and we saw this firsthand is there was a lack of communication. And when there was communication, I would say nine out of 10 times it was wrong. And not because we were trying to be inauthentic in our communication, but we were so taxed. And then when we would have an issue, a supply chain challenge, um, things would go off the rails and then all bets were off. We had to go back and say, oh, now, now we're missing such and such part. So this is gonna be a little more delayed. Well, we didn't necessarily follow that communication all the way through to the dealer who could then communicate it to the retail customer. So then by the time we got around to remembering, hey, this boat is going to a customer that has no idea why it's delayed, then it was just like digging out of a hole at that point. And there was um, trust was eroded. Um, Some customers weren't even sure after having talked to them, weren't even sure that we were building their boat. Like there was that much lack of trust. Right. They and and honestly, I can't I can't blame them. Yeah. There, there we we needed to do a much better job. So in the end, this 
this program kind of came out of necessity where we just, we all felt like it wasn't the way we weren't making lives better. Honestly, that's what it came down to. And we believe that we have an opportunity now, even though demand may not be as feverish, these retail customers, our dealer network for that matter, deserve to have a level of communication that is the same high level of product that we produce. Right. That's probably the simplest yeah. way to put it. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's crazy. We, we, we knew it in the moment. Uh, we know it, you know, a, a year removed from the pandemic, but yeah. we're going to look back at the, that two or three year period and just shake our heads and wonder how we, how we survived <laughs> yeah. workforce issues, yeah. supply chain issues and so forth. But, but here's the thing, right? I mean, you know, uh, hundreds of boat builders out there, um, everybody's going through these problems. All yeah. these dealers are having the problems. All these customers are having this question of where's my boat? <laughs> When's my boat showing up? What's the status? Was there a moment or a, an incident or something where you like were able to go, Hey, this is what needs to happen. Well, honestly, it, <laughs> it happened to me. So, so it's one thing for us to empathize with our dealer network and our retail customers. Absolutely. I mean, like I said, it came, normally it was my responsibility to have individual phone conversations about individual boats that were delayed for one reason or another. So I was definitely involved in that, but on the other side of things, it happened to me. So I, and I think I shared this with you in, um, in July of 2020, I ordered a Ford Bronco. And, and I was over the moon. I mean, my husband and I have been for years talking about getting a Jeep and, but I'm a Ford girl. And, uh, and I was, I was just so ecstatic when they come out with this Bronco. So I, I play, you know, place my, whatever it was, it was like a placeholder order for it. And, um, my family in, here in town owns a Ford dealership and um not not close enough family where i get a deal mind you <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they are a great dealership <laughs> and um uh, so that's the other reason i buy ford but but i ordered it and i i mean we didn't hear anything for a long time like it it would you know there would be large gaps in communication and i would never hear anything from my my cousins who own the dealership when I did hear something, it was directly from Ford, either via an email or they sent us some packages of goods that were really fun, you know, like, hey, we haven't forgotten about you type scenarios, which I appreciated. But at the same time, my my local dealer didn't know what was going on. I would get these direct communications from Ford and there was just a gap there. Yeah. And I, And then if they asked, they would normally get some kind of an answer about where it was at, what was happening. Um, and consequently that was a two-year process so i ended up getting my bronco in july of 2022 wow. um yeah so it was which i love it's awesome <laughs> but at the same time it was two years it took me to get that vehicle and this is that it's this is the first vehicle i've ever purchased not new but where it was built for me from an order okay. from the factory and i just thought they got it right partially and and I appreciated that. But at the same time, I thought that there was an opportunity for us to improve and get it all the way right. Whereas we're communicating to the retail customer, but with the visibility of the dealer and the participation of the dealer. So the dealer understands what it is we're sending the customer, as well as they participate in that content. Um, and, and that's where I thought there was a miss because in our industry, like I said, we were so busy. Um, we had so many sales, which was an amazing problem to have. But at the same time, we weren't servicing each sale to the level of the quality of our product that we were producing. And ultimately, what would happen is that lack of communication when the when the boat does show up at the dealership and the dealer does that delivery with the customer, they're already so frustrated because of the lack of communication. We've we've ruined that experience for them. You know, and and now they're they're ultra um, sensitive. They scrutinize even more because of the lack of trust. Right, right. Yeah, I think you know, exactly. We we you know, 
we know, for example, we have some people in the office who've done Disney events, Disney cruises. And when you do that, um, they're, they're sending you materials and they're sending you things right. that are helping you get excited. They sent, right. I think they sent his kids, um, you know, coloring books and that sort of thing to get them excited yeah. about the, the trip in the events industry. We've done a lot of research and study on this, the anticipation phase between the day that you register for the event and the day that you arrive at the event and how you can make the experience a better experience for, for your attendees. So it makes a lot of sense that, Hey, we've ordered a boat and the boat's not going to be here for a while. Uh, yep. How do we, how do we interject some of that excitement and, and experience that or the, to, to improve the experience there? So what, what goes into that? What, what types of things do you look at as far as improving that experience? Well, what we came up with ultimately is a very customizable process and I think that's one of the reasons why it, it hasn't been done more in the past is extremely labor and, and financially um, intense. I mean, it, it's, and it's, it's not one of those things where I can point at, you know, a balance sheet and say, here's the return we got on this. Right. Um, it is definitely um, a brand, a brand bolster, um, a perception bolster. And I think that's those types of initiatives are, it's difficult to see the return um, right away. And sometimes it's, it's difficult to really calculate that return, um, at least in a, you know, a solid numeric metric. Right. And I think that's the hardest part. I, not, I, I think, I know that that's the hardest part for us is it's, I have to ask for a certain amount of resources to be dedicated to this, um, both in individuals to execute these processes, but also in um, contractors that we work with to create uh, content and collateral to go along with these processes, actual goods that we'll be sending out, um, that we are sending out to uh, to customers as they wait for their boat. Uh, so there's a big investment and it's, it's definitely kind of a one-off approach. So the way that we start the approach is with the direct email from me. So, a customer can reply back to that email and ask really any question they want once we start these communications. So, and while I have a team that helps me uh, answer those questions in a lot of cases and, and um, fulfill any additional um, wants or needs that the customer might have, it's still very customizable. It's very unique for a customer, but that's really the way we want it. I mean, we're a custom boat manufacturer. Right. We don't build a boat until it's ordered. It could be ordered for dealer stock, but in a lot of cases over the past several years, it's been a retail ordered boat. And so they've dedicated that time and energy into creating something that is unique to them. I mean, for, for our RI245, there are literally almost 24 billion unique combinations that you can order that boat in. Um, and that's really just referring to color choices. So, I mean, when I say we're a custom boat manufacturer, we are a custom boat manufacturer. Sure. So why shouldn't we customize their experience throughout their boat being built the same way we customize their boat? Uh, that that's what I that's what I keep coming back to is we need that unique experience. It's not it's not something I can say is going to be um I don't know, inexpensive. It, right. it, you know, when it talks when we talk about dedicating resources to it. But it is something that needs to be one off. It needs to be as unique as the boat they've ordered from us. Yeah. And um, that's one of our main BHAGs for our strategic plan. This four year strategic plan is elevating the customer experience. And that customer could be our dealers or it could be the retail customer. You've got to remember that uh, really our direct customer is our dealer. And we want to make the experience for them just as remarkable so that then they feel empowered and inspired to share that same remarkable experience with the customer, their retail customer. We feel like that that's going to be the best example to set. Um, I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, I think that's that's great <laughs> insight. I, part of where my mind is going with it is, so you've taken the lead on this. You've come up with the concept. You've uh, been the one driving it and the emails are coming from you and that sort of thing. I'm wondering over time, I got to imagine you're learning, you know, different ways and things that work and don't work and so forth. But over time, is there a balance between 
what the manufacturer should be doing in this this phase and what the dealer should be doing in this phase? I think so. And I think what's going to end up happening using us as kind of not a guide, but as an example, uh, the dealer will then find their place to interject their content, their um, local experience, you know, local information. I think they're going to find their place among what we're doing. Um, they're never invisible in our process, but I can't say that our process really speaks to what they bring to the table uniquely um, from their dealership or in their area. Right. So that's where I see it going is honestly, I don't really see it getting more automated necessarily. I see it becoming more, um, more specific yeah. uh, with the dealer interjecting their content and their local area or their local dealerships information. Right. It's a great, definitely a great way to, to team up, to deliver on that Absolutely. unique experience. Yeah. Cause like I said, we've got to, we've got to um, create that experience for our dealer first uh, and then ultimately help them have the tools to do that for their retail right. customer. Right. And it's interesting too. I mean, there's a lot of nice features and benefits of this program, but at the, at the base of this, at the foundation of it, it's, there's a lot of it. That's just really about the communication side of it. Right. Oh, and just absolutely. say where are things 100%. at. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I, I, I shared this with you previously, but one of the things, um, that at the risk of getting myself in trouble with a bunch of uh, boat dealers, I, I bought an RV a few years back, um, <laughs> And we, we already had a boat, so that wasn't an issue, but, um, we found the floor plan that we liked, but the dealer didn't have it in stock. So we ordered it and this was pre pandemic and there was no communication. I mean, zero communication from the manufacturer or the dealer to the point where after repeated calls and calls and calls and one day I called and said, when is the, when is it arriving? Uh, and the dealer's like, oh, it showed up this morning. Uh, <laughs> and like, like he didn't know that it was going to, right. but I had even sent a message to the factory that said, Hey, my dealer told me that I'm, it's going on the production line this week. We are so excited. If you could send us a photo of it on the production line, we would be right. over the moon about that. And I never even got a response. I never even got a no, thanks. Can't do that. Right. But I mean, I, I just think about the power of that experience and what, what more it could have been had the dealer or the manufacturer just said, you know, instead of the the keychain that I got, if there was a keychain that said this was custom built for Matt and Allison, right? right? Or or whatever it would have been, just some nice little touch point like that could have made okay. such a difference. And think about the, you know, so you talked about the difficulty of measuring the ROI. Mm -hmm. But think about the social media ROI on that yeah. if something yeah. like that's to happen and what they're going to do to share. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I mean. It, you, you create that remarkable experience. It doesn't have to be, you know, a monumental effort. You know, it could be something small. It's got to be something that resonates with that customer. And of course, we don't know what's going to resonate with them until we take the time to connect with them on an authentic level yeah. and understand what's going to move the needle in their life. You know, yeah. we talk about making life better. How do we know what to make better unless we know those right. individuals? Right. And I think that's, that's more of that dedication of resource. I mean, you have to, we have to get out of our own way and ultimately be open to hearing what's going to make a difference with them. Yeah. Um, and then try to provide that even on some small level. I mean, we can't be everything to everyone, but at the same time, we can attempt to do something. Right. Yeah. Right. Are you finding uh, any of your dealers engaging with this process and, and are they trying some things out? They're actually, everybody is extremely stoked about it. We've been, we've rolled um, kind of a truncated version out of this over the last year um, yeah, with, um, with Supreme boats specifically. And we have had amazing results and I think the dealers have seen that and just the level of commitment from our side, I believe is helping them take that next step to make that commitment um, from their dealership to really bolstering that customer experience. Um, I, we talk about, we talk about this, you know, having enough time, not enough time in the day, what should we dedicate our time to? And to me, we can't look at things in in that way, when it comes to our own time management, this isn't something that necessarily makes sense to for me to get on the phone with a customer 
um, from our dealer, the boat shop in Atlanta, who's ordered a Supreme boat, but it's not going to be there in the time that we had originally said. So I need to have a conversation with this customer. It doesn't pencil out for me to have those conversations, but I'm going to have them every single time because it is making their life better. Right. I think that's, it's just being able to rationalize that for ourselves that we're never going to be able to point to um, this as a, a smart business function. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's not, it's not, and everybody will say, oh, you can't sustain it. Um, it's too much uh, resource. Really, it's not. Right. Really, this is what we should be dedicating our time to is yeah. the customer's experience. Yeah. I love yeah. the way that that making lives better uh, approach cascades down through everything, right? It's, Absolutely. it's employees and customers and dealers and everything. Yeah. Um, what, uh, are you getting feedback or anything like that from any of the customers yet on, on some of the oh, yeah. uh, tactics? Yeah. yeah. And they, they love it. And it's, um, like I said, we, the, the version that we rolled out initially is, is a little bit of a, a truncated version of what we're ultimately doing. And, uh, and and we even had amazing response to just the the small touches that we had added there. And I think now it's you know I, I think it's going to be incredible. Honestly, um, I think I don't think we even understand um, how much this is going to just make life people's lives better, but also improve our customer experience overall. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't want to get into uh, exposing any trade secrets or anything like that, but there are, are there any specific like elements of it that you feel like you could share that uh, here's the types of things that we do? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that obviously I mentioned, we are a custom boat manufacturer, so we have a unique opportunity to take this one-off um, piece of art that this customer is creating and not only help them, um, we, we have a lot of choices when it comes to building our boat. So what we'd like to do is, is a little bit of, you know, stop selling, start helping like Zig Ziglar always said. And, um, we want to kind of demystify that whole colorizing process of our boats. I mean, there's so many different custom elements that you can choose. We want to make that fun. I mean, that's the first piece you've given your deposit, you know, you're buying a Centurion or a Supreme, but now the next step is what's it going to look like? Yeah. What options and features is it going to have? And I want it to be unique to the way my family uses a boat. And I want us to look like, um, you know, we're special on the water and for you to know it's me coming down the lake. And I think that process can kind of be, I mean, left unhelped, be a little anxiety ridden. And we don't want that to happen. So the very first thing we do is we help you spec your boat essentially. And we make it fun. Yeah. And so not only have we created a number of pieces of content to help, we've also interjected some ideas of ways that you can even extend your fun, you know, by um, making a, an experience for your whole family or for your group of friends, allowing them to participate, what tools we have available and helping you understand how to use those tools to pick all of your colors. Um, we make it the process, the elevated process that it should be, but we also make it fun. Yeah. And we offer things like coming to take a plant tour and to see a boat or all of our boats in person before you make those color decisions. You can also do a virtual plant tour with us where we will get on a, a Teams call uh, with the customer and the dealer, and we will walk them through the factory. We will take them through our design center if they wow. can't be here in person. Uh, we want to make it fun. I did that. Honestly, um, I did that with the Carr brothers, Derek and David Carr bought a Centurion from us or actually through one of our local dealers. And uh, they bought an RI-265. And, you know, as you might imagine, Derek is a quarterback for a professional football team. David's a commentator for NFL Network. So they're not normally in the same place at the same time. Right. So we did a virtual plant tour and then we did a virtual design center experience where we looked at actual colors. I would take, you know, my phone out to the factory floor and okay, we've got a red, blue, and black here. Or we've got a red, white, and blue here. If you put this vinyl next to this vinyl, this is how it looks. And um, wow. it was a really cool process because you start to understand who is kind of the, 
the color boss, you know, who who wears the color pants. And then then you start to see who's the options guy or who gets to pick the engine size, you know? So it was very interesting to see, but there's always a lot of unique um, opinions about that type of thing. But all we're here to do is make the process easier and more fun. Yeah. Uh, I so, it. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's really part, that's just the initial process. Yeah. So if you get me talking about this, Matt, I could talk about this forever. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so be careful what you wish for, yeah. but, um, but that's, that's the first step in the process. And then beyond that, we want to help them see what's happening here at the factory. So if they ordered um, an all hex interior on their RI245, and we just got um, the red hex they chose for their main accent on their upholstery in, we're going to send them a picture of that roll of vinyl. Hey, look what we got in today. Your boat may not be spraying and starting production for months, but we got in the vinyl for your boat today, you know, that goes with it and helping them understand those, those little, I don't know, I don't, I, not really victories, but those little, um, uh, things that are going to make up their boat in the end and uh, and just share those those little victories with them, I guess. Yeah. That, hey, it came in, you know. Yeah, um, that's yeah. Yeah, that's great. I know you said uh, stop selling and start uh, helping. Uh, yeah. I got to imagine that your dealers can use this as a sales tool and a, something to attract, you know. Absolutely. T- yeah. Absolutely. And I think they see it as that way. In fact, um, we've had, you know, this is an, a, um, a process that we initiate typically when a boat is retail sold and we're building a, a custom sold boat. However, there are boats that we're selling or building for stock and that a dealer is going to sell to a customer to be determined. And we are going to have available to that dealer a kind of a parts of this process that sure. maybe don't have to happen simultaneously with the build that then they can share with that customer that ultimately buys the boat. Um, you know, it's, 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 I think it's things like that, working through things like that and getting feedback from the dealers that allow us to make this process even better. Yeah, absolutely. Where, where do you see, you know, looking down the road with this, where do you see this program evolving to and how do you see it continuing to, to grow uh, the way that you guys have, have grown your brands? Well, I, I, I feel like it'll, it'll come to a point um, where it will take on a life of its own, I'm imagining, and it will require even more resources to sustain and, and to, or to make better for that matter. So I think it's going to become a, a pivotal part of our, of our marketing model, uh, ultimately. And I think, I think we're going to have to, I, ultimately, I think we're going to have to have a team that this is what they do. Yeah. Um, we call right now the, um, the team that kind of is overseeing it right now. And really it's, a, it's two people, um, if not me, not included, uh, but we call them care warriors because uh, that's what they're about. You know, they're all about caring. And we have an acronym that we use uh, here all the time is care and it's a connection, appreciation, responsiveness, uh, and enthusiasm. And ultimately that's what we want to do. We want to have an authentic connection with our customer. We want to be able to appreciate where they're coming from and accept that even though we may not um, be coming from the same exact place, that their feelings and um, viewpoint has validity and then respond to that as best we can to create enthusiasm, you know, for an extended period of time, either through their entire boat build or the whole time that they own their boat. So our care warriors are pretty much dedicated to that. And that's, that's really what the post deposit nurturing is in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can definitely feel here uh, in the way that you're talking about it, the authentic in- engagement with this, this whole thing. And certainly the, the enthusiasm uh, part of it that goes into it as well. So, I mean, kudos to you. This is a, this is a fabulous program. Uh, I really am excited about watching this thing, you know, continue to evolve and, and continue to help um, make lives better uh, as, as we go. So kudos um, I don't know any other thoughts or comments that you want to share about it that, that we should know, or this we cover everything. Um, well, gosh, yeah, I, th- I think so. I mean, like I said, you get me talking about it and I could talk forever, but I think the only other thing that I want to point out is, is it, this is a perfect example of something that an idea that came out of, you know, something that may have happened to me personally, but it's really our team that is pushing this forward. Um, they've all kind of 
uh, taken their own piece of it and our marketing team, our sales team, for that matter, our dealer network, and they're what's going to make this better and ultimately continue to make lives better through a program like this. I mean, you know, it's a, it's such a team environment here and we know immediately when an idea is a bad idea, even though it might sound good on the outset because yeah. you don't have a lot of buy-in and you don't have people, you know, wanting to, Hey, what if we tweak this or brainstorming about that? And that's how, you know, but really the idea is just the beginning. I mean, they're going to take this as a team to a level that I, I probably can't even imagine at this point. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, again, congratulations on this. This is, I mean, on all, all the success, the great idea here, the, the, very innovative approach to the customer experience. You know, customer experience is one thing that we're we're really big on here at MRAA, and we want to help our dealers uh, do a better job of delivering that. And you can certainly see how this would uh, to just exceed all expectations from a customer experience standpoint. So, kudos to you and the team, and congratulations on that. Well, absolutely. Uh, and I hope we get to talk, you know, a year from now and and it's more than any of us had ever hoped and more than we thought we could manage. And <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Well, hey, listen, uh, I also want to just say thank you. Uh, thank you for all your support and for your time here today. And, you know, Centurion Supreme and, and Correct Craft as a, as a family have been very supportive of, of what we do here at MRA and of our dealers and your dealers and so forth. So really appreciate that very much. I uh, just want to say thank you for that. Thanks for taking the time to join me here on the podcast. Of and course. Uh, we'll hopefully see you out at one of the boat shows very soon. I bet we will. Thank you, Matt. We yeah, appreciate you. the MRAA. Thank yeah. you so much for what you do. You bet. Thank you. And thank you to all our listeners out there. Appreciate you joining us here for episode eight of the Boat Biz podcast. Uh, for the MRAA, I'm Matt Groon, and I hope to uh, see, you out, see you out at one of the shows very soon. Take care. Bye.